Good morning, everybody, and welcome to MindSpeak. And it's great that you've made time on a Sunday morning. We've got a tremendous guest here today, Professor Howard French. And I can't think of a more opportune moment to have the professor talking to us, given what we are witnessing happening around the world today, whether it's the trade war, the emergence of China, this very personalized uh, adversarial well, kind of situation between two big world leaders. But first of all, I'd like to uh, give an opportunity to Dr. Murigi to introduce uh, herself and the Columbia Global Centers uh, with whom we partnered for this particular MindSpeak. And we're deeply grateful for the support that you've given us, Dr. Murigi. And uh, if I might ask you to say a few words. Sorry, let me just. Uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you so much for coming this morning uh, to listen to uh, this very important talk on Africa-China relations uh, by Professor Howard uh, French from uh, the Columbia University uh, Global Graduate School of Journalism. Um, my name is Morugi Dirango, as uh, Mr. Sachu has said. I'm the director of Columbia Global Centers, Nairobi. Uh, Columbia Global Centers are associated, as you can tell from the name, with Columbia University in New York. And we have nine centers in different parts of the world, including Amman, Beijing, Istanbul, Mumbai, Nairobi, Paris, Rio, Santiago, and we have the newest center being in Tunis. So we have two centers in Africa. We are about to establish the 10th center in Tel Aviv soon. Uh, our mission is to connect Columbia University to the region. And we do this by conducting research jointly in partnership with uh, Columbia University faculty and partners on, uh, in the region. We also do education programs as well as public programs such as this. Uh, so we invite you to come and connect with us. We are located right here in Westlands. Um, we, we can discuss different ways of partnering and engaging. Uh, but we are very, very delighted that you attended this event today, and we are very, very honored to also have Professor French with us today to come and participate in uh, the Mind Speak. So thank you very much. Pleasure. It's a real pleasure to have uh, Professor Howard wearing French, uh, and just to give you a brief introduction, though he doesn't need one, an American journalist, author, photographer, professor at the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, longtime foreign correspondent and senior writer with the New York Times. And I'm going to go back chronologically. His latest book is Everything Under the Heavens, How the Past Helps Shape China's Push for Global Power. I can't think of a more uh, uh, um, you know, opportune moment to be engaging on this subject. Was a university instructor in the Ivory Coast in the 1980s before becoming a reporter, reported extensively from Western and Central Africa. Um, was that your first book, A Continent for the Taking? First book was actually A Continent for the Taking, which was about his experience in Africa. Um, uh, I can't forget the description of General Butt Naked with his uh, potion, which was meant to keep him alive from bullets. A description of the fall of Mobutu Sese Seko in Kinshasa. It had this incredible fin de siècle type of mood and really has touched on all the major, big major events that happened on our continent during that, pre during that period. Um, was New York Times bureau chief for the Caribbean, Central America from 1990 to 1994, covered Haiti, Cuba, Nicaragua, El Salvador, one of the newspaper's first black correspondents. Um, from 1998 to 2003, Professor French was Tokyo bureau chief for the Times, covering Japan and the Koreas speaks English, Mandarin, French, Portuguese, learnt Japanese uh, in a year at the University of Hawaii, and the Japanese language is no easy language, nor is the Chinese. 
Um, and then in, in the, ba the latest book, which we have here, we only have four copies, and I'm buying one. And they're for sale for 2,000 bob, so if anybody wants them, you're most welcome. Um, uh, so a, a tremendous author, a, an exhibited documentary photographer, a multi-year project, and a book called Disappearing Shanghai, which focused on the old quarters of Shanghai before all the development uh, that we've seen happen. Is also president of IRIN. I didn't know that. A not-for-profit news agency that focuses on the humanitarian sector based in Geneva, Switzerland. Lots of awards. Professor of the Year in 2016 at the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. It really is a very, very big privilege to have Professor French here today talking to us. Thank you very much to uh, Marugi for uh, your kind hospitality and unfailing collegiality. Um, uh, Marugi and I have seen each other a number of times in New York City. Uh, so thank you, Marugi, for your um, ho hospitality and organizational brilliance and and friendship, really. Um, I've become a, I'm a faculty supporter of the Global Centers, and um, so we know each other initially in that context, but it's great to be in your uh, backyard now and uh, uh, your, as your guest. Uh, and thank you also to Ali Khan, who uh, I'm doing uh, an event with now for the second time. The first time was in 2014, and it was not a live public event like this, but we sat um, at um, uh, the uh, Norfolk. Norfolk Hotel here in Nairobi um, in a very nice suite and had a lengthy conversation which was later made available online and yes. which um, I really enjoyed and was impressed by your acumen as an interviewer. Thank you. Um, uh, but also your hospitality and friendship as well. We've maintained contact ever since then and, and it's been really great. This this little bit awkward, only having eight books with me. Um, I don't sell books personally. Uh, it's not my job. Um, I'm always amused when people say that people write books because if you say a little of this or a little of that in the book, you'll sell a few more copies. I mean, the marginal income that one might get from something like that as an author, at least in the markets that I'm familiar with, is 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 negligible. So, so I don't think that's why most people who are not best-selling authors write books. Uh, anyway, we don't, the authors don't sell the books, so it was, this was sort of an afterthought. I um, rounded up a few copies and brought them with me. Uh, and so uh, it's first come, first serve for the few that we have. In any event, these are not new books. So my last book, um, uh, Everything Under the Heavens, was published um, uh, almost two years ago now. Um, and uh, China's Second Continent was published, in, I think, in 2014. Um, and so I'm not really going to talk directly off of the books. I'll relate to them a little bit. What I want to do, though, is to speak about history, and um, both Chinese history and African history and global history. I said both, but that's three things. And to try to run a thread through these three things to try to understand better how did we arrive at the present moment in terms of Africa's relations with the rest of the world, and um, I think there's a particular interest in Africa's relations with China, but that's not the only thing we'll discuss here today. Uh, in my book, China's Second Continent, um, which, uh, as I said, came out in 2014, I explored uh, the terrain of uh, a very large and growing number of Chinese recent migrants to Africa in a variety of countries across the continent. And I looked at these communities in every, um, all of the different cardinal directions of Africa, so in some northern African places and some eastern, western, and southern African places. And one of the main impulses, or I guess sources of interest from uh, the publishers, I had done a little bit of magazine work on this topic before the book was done, but a little of the interest, I think some of the standing public interest in this topic was really based on some very widespread and deeply held stereotypes about what is going on between China and Africa. Um, and in, in, insofar as, as migrants are concerned, the most important stereotypes, I, I'd like to just sort of dispel right from the outset. Um, and these were easily disproven in the earliest phases of research for this book. Um, and I wouldn't dwell on them except for the fact that they are so persistent, I think they need to be addressed right, so right off of the top. The first of these is that <coughs> um, 
the influx of recent Chinese arrivals in various African countries and of Chinese economic activity at the individual and small entrepreneur level is something that is driven at a high level by the Chinese state. Um, that is very easily disproven. Th that's not the case. There was no sort of master plan by the Chinese state to move lots of people to Africa. Um, it took um, a, a very short time in a small number of countries traveling around doing the research um, for this book to understand how it was that Chinese people started to arrive in, in, in Western African countries for the f in initially, uh, and, in, and in Zambia also in the early 1990s. Um, and it had nothing, it had almost nothing to do with any sort of high, high end uh, Chinese national government kind of directive. Um, actually, nothing to do with the directive. It did have something to do with state um, company contracts, but this was not by design, which is the main point. And the second point is that, so there's this idea that, uh, or there had been this idea when I set out to write this book, that China was interested in African countries and that Chinese people were interested in African countries really pretty much exclusively for natural resource purposes. That China wanted to get its hands on African resources and therefore it was rushing into resource rich countries and that migrants were following uh, Chinese corporate and business activity in resource rich countries. Well, this is also pretty easily disproven. Um, there are some resource rich countries that have large Chinese presences, but if you travel around this continent a little bit with an eye to this question, you will discover very quickly as I did and as I wrote about that there are Chinese people everywhere. Um, that recent Chinese migrants, these populations that are the topic of this book, have been established in all kinds of African countries. Big countries, small countries, resource rich countries, primary product and agricultural type economies, what have you. Uh, and I opened the book um, in, a, in, in Mozambique um, where I, the most colorful character that I encountered in a year of sort of territorial exploration, t exploration of the terrain is what I'd meant to say. Um, and this guy was, um, Hao Shangli was the name of the character and he was just the, one of the most kind of rugged, salt of the earth, pithy, kind of no-nonsense people you could ever meet. Um, and I went on a very long drive with him from um, Maputo to his farm uh, in sort of north central Mozambique. And this was an unforgettable drive and it was, we had never met before. He had offered to take, to, he came to Maputo to meet me, never met me before, and offered to drive me to his farm. I met him online. Um, and we spoke Chinese throughout the trip and he had just one incredible thing to say after another. And I, there's, I won't bore you with the long story, the details of the long story, but you know, one of the most important things for me to establish was why he had chosen Mozambique. And that, in fact, the answer to that is, is a very interesting story, and you'll have to buy the book to get that, I'm afraid. But, but he said to me, you know, Mr. French, um, you know, the thing you need to understand is that you should never go to an African country where there's no Chinese people. And I, I said, what do you mean? Um, uh, and he said, first of all, there's no such a thing, that there are, African pe there are Chinese people in every African country. But just, if, in, just imagine if there were a place where there's no Chinese people, that means that that's a place, I thought he was gonna say that's a place where it's very dangerous. That's a place where there's war or mayhem or, or disease or epidemic or you know, whatever. He said, it wasn't that at all. He said, if there were such a place, that would mean that in that place it was impossible to do business. Um, and, and that said a lot to me, that you know, Chinese people in this period are seeking business opportunities all over the world. And Africa, for very particular historic reasons, um, began in the early 1990s to become the kind of launching pad for this outward bound Chinese experience. Chinese people are of course everywhere in the world um, a, a, of recent migration. So in Southern, South America, in Central Asia, in all over Africa, what have you, right? There are Chinese, recent Chinese migrants in large number for the first time in modern history, right? But this entire thing begins, this entire story begins in Africa in the early 1990s. And so the first part of my talk in the first part of my talk, I'd like to talk, sort of explain my understanding of the history 
the, uh, behind why that is. Um, and I, because I, first of all, I think it's a very interesting story. I think it's a poorly understood story. But I also think it is a helpful story for kind of situating us to understand better today's world and to kind of try to anticipate a little bit, which is um, uh, what I expect to be perhaps one of the topics of conversation when we get into the question and answer period. Uh, you know, where are things going? W you know, what should one expect in the future from, from, uh, from China, from, from, from Africa's engagement with the rest of the world, et cetera? So to tell this history in the way I think it should be told, I have to go back I have to begin in the 1970s, and I'm, it's, I'm going to give you a very rough uh, and highly compressed sort of thumbnail account of, of uh, the Chinese reform era. So, um, of course, in 1949, um, the communists come to power in China. Mao Zedong becomes the head of state after a victory in the civil war against the nationalists. Um, uh, and Mao rules until 1976. Mao dies in 1976. Up until that point, China had been a very, economically speaking, inwardly looking country. It had had a very strong emphasis on self-reliance. It had not been uh, in very active pursuit of world trade. It had not been a big manufacturing power at all. Um, and it had, uh, under Mao, a kind of vision of itself as, um, a country that would prevail by eventually by surviving, that with a very large population, you know, um, eventually the United States and the Soviet Union would sort of cancel each other out. And even if one of them initiated hostilities against China, which was a real poss possibility in the 1960s, especially with the, the, the Soviets, there was very close to having a nuclear war between China and the Soviet Union in, in the 1960s. China, in Mao's view, had such a large population that it would that it would survive no matter what, and while well, the others would sort of eventually fade away and disappear. So Mao dies in 1976. Before Mao died, in this, especially in the 1960s, but actually beginning even earlier than that, Mao had a very uh, important lieutenant uh, named Deng Xiaoping, and Deng, who later succeeded Mao was this person who had shown a great high degree of competency in a lot of different areas. He had been a very successful military leader. He had been a very successful party leader. He had, been, he had shown a talent for economic organization and management, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But Mao had this fear of Deng as somebody who, given a chance, would put China on what Mao liked to call the capitalist road. Now, Mao was a very paranoid person in many ways. Uh, Mao, the Mao period was one of um, constant campaigns uh, and um, uh, ritual kind of trials and hazings and, and internal exile and, and repression of people who he imagined to be ideological enemies. But with regard to Deng Xiaoping, Mao was not being paranoid. Mao died uh, in 1976. And two or three years later, Deng consolidated his control over uh, power in China, even though he was not the designated successor. And very soon thereafter, begins to do what? Begins to put China on the capitalist road. So the capitalist road begins in a place that at the time, um, in the very early 1980s, uh, was a fishing village uh, called Shenzhen. And this place in southern China near uh, Hong Kong um, was chosen by Deng as a place to begin a series of economic experiments. Um, and Deng chose Shenzhen for a variety of reasons. Shenzhen was chosen because, uh, partly because it was close to Hong Kong, and uh, China was on a per capita basis in 1980, roughly about the same wealth as Bangladesh. So an extremely poor country on a per capita basis. Uh, and Hong Kong was a rich place. And Hong Kong was a place, was a Chinese city under British control where there was lots of capital and where there was lots of economic expertise. And at that time, although not so much anymore, a lot of manufacturing. And so Deng had this idea that if I set up a place which we'll call a special economic zone on the edge, uh, southern edge of China near Hong Kong, I can attract economic expertise and capital from, from uh, Chinese capitalists initially based in Hong Kong and begin some experiments in modern economic production and management. 
in my special economic zone. There was another reason why he chose Shenzhen, though, and that is because um, the rest of the ruling class of China did not like this idea at all. So the rest of the ruling class was conserved, it was con consisted for the most part of people who Mao had put in power and who uh, still bought into uh, the Maoist kind of program of economic self-sufficiency and class warfare uh, and um, an ideological commitment to socialism. And they all knew how suspicious Mao was of Deng uh, f uh, on this basis that he would become a capitalist rotor. And so Deng had to proceed very carefully. And so he said, well, if I'm going to try some experiments in capitalism, I have to put them in a far sort of out of the way place at the edge periphery of China where I won't arouse too much suspicion, there won't be too much commotion, and the conservatives around me, conservatives meaning people who do not wish for change, won't become uh, uh, mobilized uh, against me. And so Shenzhen, this tiny fishing village, is chosen, and China sets up this economic zone system. Uh, and it becomes a, I, you know, normally I give a talk that lasts, I spend 45 minutes on this part, but I'm going to do this really quickly. Mm -hmm. Shenzhen becomes a, an incredible success. If you, has anyone in this room been to Shenzhen? Raise your hand higher if you could. So Shenzhen, for th those of you who have been to Shenzhen, is like, you know, I mean, this is, it's, a, it's sort of an extraordinary thing, even for those of us who have lived in China or who have spent lots of time in China. It's still hard to kind of completely, uh, um, deal with this fact, but Shenzhen started from nothing in the early 1980s, a true village, and is now uh, a global city of the first rank. I mean, it's just an extraordinary place. I have seen um, it, I have heard it said, I've seen it written, I have no idea how to measure this or who's, what the nature of the source is, but it doesn't seem sort of, certainly, it doesn't seem outlandish that Shenzhen has more skyscrapers than New York City. Right. Yes. Um, so this all begins to happen in the 1980s, uh, but we're going to sort of trace the first couple of steps and then, then we're going to jump ahead a bit. So Deng succeeds in setting up the special economic zone in Shenzhen, the fishing village. It is more or less walled off. He controls entry and access of Chinese people into it. You can't, not any old job seeker can come there. That would have caused, if it had begun to succeed, a kind of run on the town. There would have been a, a kind of a, a chaos, right? Um, and so it's very quietly managed, becomes very successful, and because it was so successful, and successful in, in some very important particular ways, successful, A, in making money, China was very poor, China needed to make money, successful, B, in absorbing technology. So in this case, the main technology was manufacturing technology. China was starting out in modern industrialization, meaning uh, the sort of very typical first rungs of, 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 of manufacture, which are things like inject injection plastics and textiles, right? Um, and so China absorbed this technology via the Hong Kong companies that wished to it invest in this special economic zone. And by the way, they wanted to invest in the special economic zone because China had, <coughs> although it was very poor, a highly educated, by the standards of the rest of the world, and disciplined workforce, which was willing to work, in fact, eager to work for very low wages. And so the Hong Kong capitalists said, we get disciplined workers who are, are, are well-educated and we don't have to pay them much. Great, let's invest in, in Shenzhen and bring some of our manufacturing of plastics and textiles and simple electronics and things like that there to make them, and we can realize a higher profit rate, right? From the Chinese perspective, the mainland Chinese perspective, the idea was not just we'll make money, but we will, we will absorb some of these new technologies. And so far I'm speaking, I've spoken of, of what I'll call hard technologies, meaning, you know, the nitty gritty of manufacturing. But China also wanted to absorb what I'll call soft technologies, which means how to manage a modern enterprise in a capitalist mode of production. And so these Chinese company, I'm sorry, these Hong Kong companies set up in, 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 Hong, in Shenzhen and they begin to manufacture and China's making lots of money, but China's also doing these other two things, absorbing hard and soft technology at a very high pace. And this becomes an impressive success for Deng. And the resistance, 
of the conservatives around him begins to fade, and China begins to proliferate um, special economic zones around the country. And I don't know, ultimately, in fact, there are still some, there are still special economic zones in China, but I don't know ultimately how many were made, but they begin to proliferate. Resistance goes away, China's um, uh <coughs> opening and reform era, as it came to be called, begins to be perceived as a great success, and the rest is, as they say, history, right? China is now the manufacturing power that leads the world, uh, and Chinese people on a per capita basis are no longer poor, uh, and China has lots of cities, actually, that have built immense numbers of, sh of skyscrapers. <laughs> Uh, in a very short, and subway systems and high speed rails, et cetera, et cetera, in a very short period of time, historically speaking. So I said the rest is history, but that's giving the details of what we need to talk about uh, somewhat short shrift. And so I'm gonna back up a little bit to, to go over a couple of items that I think have to be emphasized here. <coughs> the first of them is that China has uh, a political system which places a high value on planning. This remains the case today. So China is a hybrid political system. It has a communist party, which is the sole and unique party uh, of, that has any power in the country. And, um, uh, but it has a, a largely, or uh, yes, I'll say largely capitalist economy. Um, and so you have this hybrid political system, political economy, um, but it retains even now a high degree of planning. A, and so we have to go back after this initial success in the special economic zones to talk about, I want to sort of bring this conversation to Africa very quickly and to understand how China and how Chinese people began to come to Africa gets into the topic of these planning discussions. And so in the 1980s when the special economic zones had begun to thrive and were doing a booming business and the political resistance against this in China faded away among the conservatives, there, be, there came to, the China began having, as it routinely does, a series of conversations about what is the best path for us to pursue in the future. Um, and so a series of, con of conversations take place in a, a, a setting that a particular kind of political instance in China called leading small groups, uh, uh, which are uh, members of the political elite who get together and they're assigned particular topics to deliberate on. And so some of them are economic groups and they have political plan, I'm sorry, planning discussions about economic strategy, strategy et cetera. And from what I gather, the conversations in the late 1980s, or starting in the mid and culminating in the late 1980s, went something like this that yes, it is true that the special economic zones have been an extraordinary success. But if we were only to stick to this approach to our economic development, we would be um, uh, setting ourselves up for a big failure. That this giant success from the special economic zones, however seductive it may be, is a dead end for us. That special economic zones are by their very nature enclaves. They can only by their very nature, because they're enclaves, employ a limited number of people and therefore however much money they're making, they can't really be the solution for the vast hinterland of the Chinese labor force that you have, you know, everybody knows China's 1.3, 1.4 billion people, and, you know, let's imagine, and I have no idea what the real number is, but let's imagine there were 1 million people, or f let's even say 10 million, which is certainly not the number, people working in special economic zones, that still leaves a lot of, you know, 1 point some billion people who are not working in special economic zones. And so the Chinese leadership in these special, sorry, in these uh, leading small group conversations begin to say, what should the next phase of our economic activity be? <coughs> and I don't want to sound like I'm too sort of, uh, I wear excessively rosy spectacles about the topic of, of economic planning or of planning in general. So China has had disasters on the basis of planning and it has had success on the basis of planning. I do not think that it would be um, realistic to say that the fact that a political system places a great emphasis on planning means that a political system necessarily will get everything right. But the thing we're gonna talk about, this political system was, Im was impressively clairvoyant on, was impressively prescient about. And that this thing is, <coughs> 
uh, as I had mentioned, this kind of understanding that special economic zones were kind of a false path for China, or at least not the whole solution for the future of China. And this led to some subsequent discussions which said, well, if they're not the solution to China, mind you, they're making immense amounts of money by this point, but if they're not the solution to China, what is the solution, what is the next step for China? And so Deng, by this point, has left power. Jiang Zemin takes power as his successor, as his designated successor, by the way. Deng was successful in many ways. So Mao named a designated successor. Mao's, Mao named several designated successors. They all died or were eliminated from succession one way or another. Deng, so Mao didn't succeed in, in, in managing his own succession according to his own terms. Deng did. Jiang Zemin takes power. And Jiang Zemin <coughs> sort of oversees this conversation about the next step for China. And Jiang Zemin uh, says, comes to a couple of important conclusions. One of them is that it's great to manufacture things using foreign capital in China, using foreign designs in China, using foreign management techniques in China. However, the real money in modern capitalism comes from having one's own processes, comes from having one's own brand, comes from becoming a force of globalization of one's own. And therefore, China, in order to reach the next phase of its development, can't simply be content with being an inward recipient of globalization. China has to become an outward agent or motor of globalization, meaning that China has to somehow project its economic energies and processes outside of China and to become a big actor economically on the world stage. Now, to, you have to sort of pause to consider how bold an idea this would have been at the time. We're talking about the mid to late 1980s. China had no famous companies in the mid to 19, late 1980s. China had no, almost no cons major economic presence anywhere in the world in the mid to late 1980s. China had almost no famous products in the mid to late 1980s at all. And so, so Jiang Zemin comes up at the end of the 1980s with this idea that the next phase of China's economic development must be going out. And this becomes a slogan this, of his own um, device, that China has to begin to go out into the world um, in order to conquer markets, in order to do business, uh, and that this is the secret to economic transformation of China itself. And I'm gonna, usually again, I spend 45 minutes talking about the thing I'm gonna do in five minutes. But one of the sort of key constituents of this insight of Zhang Zemin is that, is brand power. That companies that become famous internationally in global markets are able to command much higher profit margins than companies that produce components or constituents or that simply manufacture on behalf of other people in an assembly kind of fashion. And therefore, China needs to go out and find a way to develop global companies that will become brand powers in and of themselves. And that by creating brand power, Chinese companies will not just become famous and rich, but they'll capture much higher margins in terms of uh, value added than the Chinese assembly type businesses that existed in Shenzhen and elsewhere in the special economic zones ever did. And so Jiang Zemin and his um, cohorts are having these sorts of conversations in the late 1980s and uh, early in the 1990s when go out is officially announced as the government or as the state policy. And the way ch policy making in China works is that once a major initiative is decided at the central government level, endorsed of course by the Communist Party, um, an order goes to each of the provinces to go out and implement that policy. So national policy is decided, the provincial level leaders are told, mind you, Chinese provinces, Chinese provinces are m for the most part bigger than most countries, okay? So, uh, there's, pro I'll just name a few random. So s some that will be famous, you know, Sichuan, everybody knows Sichuan, right? Or Henan, or, uh, these are places with more than 100 million people, a province, right? Uh, 
And so the Chinese center, meaning Beijing, tells that a major policy initiative is decided, and the center sends the word out to the provincial leadership and says, you need to go out and implement this policy. And so the policy in question here in our discussion is going out. Late 1980s, early 1990s, Jiang Zemin says, we must go out, we must look for business in the world, we have to capture markets, we have to, de we have to develop brand name companies that can build lots of value added uh, and you know, uh, do like, let's imagine a Sony or an Apple. Apple is a great example. So Apple charges a lot more from its telephone. Its telephone, whether you like it or not, does what most telephones do. I mean, there's, there, you know, there, there are some technical differences, there are some experiential differences, but at the sort of general capacity level, cell phones are cell phones, right? Um, but Apple gets to charge a lot more for its cell phones because it has developed brand value. It commands brand value and that get, therefore gets a lot of value added. Sony did the same thing in televisions uh, a generation before that. IBM did that in computers uh, even before Sony did this in television, et cetera, et cetera. So Zemin, let's, I, I think the year was 1991 or 1992, I don't have notes for this talk, but he says, okay, we're gonna have this campaign, we're gonna tell the provincial leaders, go out into the world, look for, look for markets, sell stuff, develop companies that can, can, can develop brand value, uh, conquer the world with commercially speaking. Um, <clears throat> and the provincial leaders received this message and they, I, I am, I, this is my imagination, right? But knowing China in the 1990s as I did, the provincial leaders I imagine must have looked at each other like, what, is, what are these talking about? You know, we don't have anything that, we don't have any strong products strong meaning in terms of kind of name recognition to go out and sell to the rest of the world. How, where are we supposed to go out and, how do you do this? We, we don't, you know, our background is in an entirely sort of self-sufficient approach to economic development. We have been anti-capitalist our whole careers. All of a sudden we're being told to go out into the world and look for business and to try to develop famous companies. We don't have any competitive advantage in any particular kind of commercial or industrial area. Well, it turns out that they did. The competitive advantage that Chinese companies had was, I'm not sure that Zhang Zemin fully anticipated this, but it was in developing, beginning the development of China or the redevelopment of China. So what happened in the 19, what began to happen in the 1980s was the development of infrastructure on an immense scale in China. After the Mao, Maoist period, I don't want to speak with total derision of the Maoist period. Mao was not a failure in every regard, and he was not a success in every regard. But the Maoist period was one of that lacked high-speed economic growth and, by and large, lacked infrastructure development. So in the 1980s, with all of this new revenue from Shenzhen and the other special economic zones, all of the, econo all of the infrastructure development that China is now famous for had begun. And so China, because of its size, had an experience already in the late 1980s and early 1990s of infrastructure development by the standards of the world that was off the charts. And so Jiang Zemin, the head of state and the head of the Communist Party says, go out, develop business, go into the world, look for contracts, look for, you know, uh, to develop um, brand names and value added, et cetera, et cetera. And the provincial leaders, by the way, who get scored on the basis, not just for this policy, but for every policy, the political promotion system in China involves a sort of complex arrangement where the provincial level leaders are scored according to their performance in implementing the directives that come from the central state and party. And so they, they're told that this is a priority of the center and they get scored for this. They're looking around at each other, well, what can we do? What do we have experience in? And the thing that they had experience in was infrastructure. And so this led to the insight that the one thing that they could go out into the world markets and brag about was, we don't have a Sony, we don't have an IBM, we don't have an Apple, we don't have a, you know, <coughs> what have you, uh, but we do know how to build roads, and we do know how to build bridges, and we've been doing this on a very large scale, and we do this well, and we have reasonably low costs because we have um, such scale and because Chinese labor costs are, are at that time in particular were, were very competitive. And so 
this is something we can do. And so Jiang Zemin got behind this. And this, so the broad outlines of what I've just said so far are, are reasonably well known. But what is much less known is that already by 1992, Jiang Zemin got behind this and said, not only should Chinese companies go out, but Chinese companies should go out into Africa as a priority. Make Africa your priority. This was decided almost from the very beginning of the going out period, and it involved another set of very special insights. One of them was, yes, the provincial leaders tell us the only business they think they have any competitive advantage in at that time is in infrastructure development. Well, this leads to the, uh, the follow-on insight that Africa has this incredible thirst and need for infrastructure, right? Um, so this is something you can compete for. Um, and the Chinese state will find a, a way to get behind this by creating facilities of various sorts, state bank facilities, so that we will finance the um, uh, contracts of big Chinese companies to underdeveloped African countries that don't easily qualify or readily, re readily qualify for other sorts of contracts in world markets, be they uh, multilateral uh, lending arrangements or bilateral or commercial lending arrangements, right? The Chinese state will get behind this through what are known as policy banks. They will guarantee uh, the contracts of and provide finance of financing for the construction of infrastructure by these state infrastructure development companies. I say state companies, but many of them back then were provincial companies. So these provinces are competing for this kind of business. The other insight <coughs> that China understood, and this piece is also, I think, very poorly understood, even now in the present period of, of uh, immense ongoing interest in China-Africa, China had this insight in the early 1990s about Africa, which has been vastly underappreciated in my view. And it grew out of a few things. One of them was a, a sophisticated understanding of Africa's demographics. So Africa in the early 1990s was 800 million people. It was understood even in the early 1990s that Africa by the middle of this century would be grosso modo 2 billion people. Why was it understood by, why would the Chinese have known this? Well, the main reason is that the UN does highly reputable and uh, very competent ongoing studies of global demography. The UN gets a l hard time from certain quarters, but this is something with a very good track record and very well established that has a very high buy-in rate from countries around the world which provide their statistics in a sort of timely manner uh, and open their books to the UN. And so the UN demography, demography operation is highly reputed and has a record of performance in terms of the accuracy or margin of error of its demographic um, estimates. The UN dem so the Chinese begin reading these reports, I think, in the late 1980s, and by the early 1990s have understood that something incredible is about to happen in Africa, that Africa is about to take off, if not yet obviously economically, well, at least demographically. And we are China. We are trying to become a manufacturing superpower. We know that. We want to sell things to other people. Well, you want to sell things to other people, it behooves you to know where are the new people going to come from. And the Chinese began to understand in the late 1980s and early 1990s that the marginal growth in the global population was going to be heavily concentrated in Africa. That China, I don't think quite knew yet or wasn't, I don't imagine, this is my imagination, was not entirely confident yet that it was going to conquer as, as of the late 1980s or early 1990s every market in the world for a whole gamut of industrial goods, but they did have the insight, which in fact they have done, right? So Chinese products are now available across a broad gamut of goods all over the world, right? And China has become an extraordinary manufacturing success. I don't think anybody knew fully in 1988 or 1992 the extent to which China was going to be able to realize this. However, in the early 1990s, by then, China is thinking, Africa's population is going to double by the, mid by, the mid, uh, by the middle of this century and perhaps quadruple by the end of this century. 
the marginal increase in global population is going to be heavily skewed toward Africa. Um, most of the additional urbanization in the world is going to be taking place in Africa. What happens when there's urbanization? When there's urbanization, people, uh, economic activity intensifies. People begin to have all sorts of needs, which we'll just call and, and we'll put under the crude kind of um, portmanteau of modern. People begin to have modern needs, right? They want to have a roof over their head that's made of metal. They want to have a water heater. They want to have a refrigerator. They want to have tiles. They want to have, you know, eventually a TV and a car, et cetera, et cetera, and on and on, right? Well, that all begins with, 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 with urbanization. The Chinese knew in the late 1980s and early 1990s this extraordinary thing was going to happen in Africa called demographic takeoff and urbanization. And even if we're not sure we're going to conquer the industrial, the, the consumer markets of the entire world by today, right? We do know that if we invest in developing business and connections and contact uh, and um, commerce with Africa, we can build buy-in from African consumers and African political leaders and get Africa, develop Africa, nurture Africa as a future market for us and for Chinese products. We don't have any famous products yet, but if we start now, our products in 15 or 20 years will be familiar products to China, to Africans. They will be just as familiar as, as, as Western products. And by the way, when I first started writing about China and Africa, which goes back already almost 20 years, uh, Chinese products had a reputation for being very cheap and very unreliable and kind of low cachet and, you know, um, uh, just, you know, very second best, right? And some people smirked about this. Some African consumers uh, turned their noses up at Chinese products, but I was reminded of my own experience in a previous generation where I watched this very same thing happen with Japanese products. So when I was in high school, and I'm not going to tell you what year that was, um, this was the very same thing was happening with Japan. Japanese consumer products were going from, they were transitioning from an era where they were very cheap and very unreliable, known to catch on fire or to blow up or to break down, to becoming very, very reliable and very, very desirable, and very, very cost competitive, all at the same time. And so there's some very famous examples. I already mentioned Sony, but Toyota, Toyota cars. Toyota cars, when I was a boy, were a joke. To a joke. Toyota cars today are Toyota cars. Everybody, just, nobody jokes about a Toyota car anymore, right? So when I saw the Chinese consumer goods coming into Africa at the beginning of this century, and seeing people talk about them in the way that they did, I said, well, yeah, that's, I didn't think this is, you know, China is doomed. I thought this is kind of the normal story, that you have to get your feet into the water, and you learn your mis from your mistakes, and you keep continually trying to improve, and you keep investing in these markets, and China did so for the reasons of an understanding of demographics and of urbanization that I said, and placing a long-term bet on these sorts of relationships, right? But China did so for a further reason, which is also widely misunderstood or overlooked, uh, which I'm gonna mention quickly. I've been talking now for probably, I don't know, 35 minutes already. <laughs> okay, so um, China knew, so let's go back to the late 1980s or 1990s. What was happening in the rest of the world? So the end of the 1980s, the Berlin Wall falls, and the Soviet Union eventually dissolves. And the, the, this seems like a new epoch or era, right, in global affairs. And of course, nobody knew what was going to happen, but looking back, we can see very clearly what happened. Western Europe turned its attention to Eastern Europe, largely, initially, for reasons that make very compelling economic and historical sense, right? The Western Europeans said we have this market on our, you know, borders that consists, again, of highly educated people who are willing to work for v relatively low wages, and we have the further uh, incentive uh, in the knowledge that 
when there's trouble in Eastern Europe, the trouble usually spreads to Western Europe too. And when there's trouble in Europe, usually it becomes eventually really bad trouble. Like we've had World War I, we've had World War II, et cetera, right? So let's, as Western Europeans, try to capture these markets in Eastern Europe, try to help Eastern Europe to get off the ground. Economically speaking, it'll be better in every sense for Europeans in general, right? Economically, politically, et cetera, right? So what happens in, in, in the United States? The United States, you know, back then there was this moment where various thinkers, there's, I can't remember which French politician coined this phrase, but started talking about the United States as being a hyperpower, right? Not a superpower anymore, but a hyperpower, meaning that it was, something that had really never been seen before, that there's this one super predominant power that sort of looms over everything and, and is well beyond being challenged by any other power. Um, many people said that that can't possibly last, and in fact, it didn't last. Um, however, the United States had this moment when it had to decide what its new vocation was gonna be in the world. The United States vocation had been locked up up until that time in uh, very deep superpower competition with the Soviet Union, right? This was kind of an existential thing. I mean, I'm old enough so this like marked my boyhood, right? This was, uh, I, in elementary school, I grew up in Washington, D.C. We had bomb drills where we had to go, at least, I don't remember the frequency, but maybe once every two weeks, we had to scurry into special rooms and get underneath the desks, and this was because one day there could actually be a nuclear war, right? So, so all of this ends, right? And the United States, is, there's this confusing moment where the United States looms as, as dominant as imaginable over world affairs and yet doesn't really know what to do with itself. And the United States eventually settles in its own way through a variety of processes on sort of wars against terror. And these are largely wrapped up in, in the Muslim parts of the world, right? And huge amounts of treasure have been spent on this and we're, it's, the United States is still locked up in this. China's watching all of this. And again, back to Jiang Zemin, let's go out, let's go to Africa, let's make Africa our priority. Part of the reason why let's make Africa our priority was not just the demographics and the urbanization, but the very fact that nobody else was looking at Africa. Western Europe was looking at Eastern Europe. The United States was sort of wandering around looking for dragons to slay. Africa is standing there, 800 million people. Nobody wanted to lend money to Africa. Nothing was happening developmentally in Africa. Um, and the Chinese, you know, the A level of Western corporate sort of energy was not invested in Africa. You know, Westerners, of course, did business in Africa. They, the, China, the Japanese also did business in Africa. But it wasn't their A team that they sent here. It was not a priority for them, right? <coughs> and Africa was sort of, had come to be seen, especially in my country, but not only in my country, I believe, as kind of this um, problem child, this charity, this kind of burden that you have to lug around, that Africa's always trailing behind and it's always having a calamity of one kind or another, and Africa is this burden on the rich world that has to always come to the rescue and provide finance and support in humanitarian ways, et cetera, et cetera. So the whole mentality in the West and also in Japan, in my view, became wrapped up in this kind of hopeless view of Africa, that Africa is a place th that is essentially a charity case and you shouldn't think about Africa very much in any other capacity, right? Well, the thing I've taken this very long-winded way around to saying is that the Chinese, by virtue of their own experience, never thought of Africa this way. I do not mean to say that Chinese people are idealistic. I do not believe Chinese people are idealistic. I do not believe, I do not mean to say that I buy into some of the rhetoric that is some of the most common rhetoric about China and Africa from China, which is like win-win or we're all brothers in the South or these sorts of, I don't buy into any of that stuff. However, the Chinese knew by virtue of their own experience that poverty and underdevelopment are not destined. They are not inescapable fates, right? That poverty is something that can be escaped. Chinese people knew that because Chinese people had been poor themselves in the very recent past. So they were primed <coughs> to view Africa not as a perpetual charity case, as this condemned orphan of the world system that just is not, bother, not worth bothering thinking about in economic terms, right? They were primed to think of Africa as a place where you could actually think about in terms of economics and in terms of money making, right? 
And so this put, this was, I think, uh, a heavily underrated feature in terms of this thing that happened in the early 1990s where China said, let's go out, uh, let's go out to Africa, let's make Africa our priority. Africa's being disregarded or ignored by the rest of the rich world. By the way, this prevents, I think, they believed, the Chinese believed at that time, an extra opportunity. The fact that it's, Africa is being ignored by the major powers of the world means that China, with its fledgling companies and no brands and you know, inexperience, can afford to go out into these markets and make mistakes and learn along the way and at relatively low cost or low risk to itself, right? And so, so this all gets underway in the early 1990s. By the mid-1990s, we see the first time seed beds of the migrant populations that I described in my book. And now, of course, now it's Chinese people, as my friends in Mozambique told me, everywhere in Africa, and if you find a place that there's no Chinese people, don't go there, okay? Because that means there's no business to do that. So for some people, uh, China and Africa is old hat, right? China and Africa has been around for a long time. Um, early in this century, um, Africans were, you know, in certain environments, surprised to encounter a Chinese person. Nobody is surprised to encounter a Chinese person almost anywhere in Africa anymore. Right, uh, and, but beyond that, there's this kind of new kid on the block in terms of Chinese global kind of thought. And the new kid is, of course, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, BRI. And so China, Africa is old hat also in the sense that, um, you know, China's major um, foreign policy and economic energy is being invested in this new thing, this new initiative, the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and so I want to close in talking about how do these things relate. In a superficial way they relate because BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, has become a kind of plaque that gets stamped on everything, right? Anything China does economically outside of China is eligible somehow, it would seem, to being called BRI, right? I have uh, a Chinese colleague who I spoke with the other day who said to me, uh, kind of funny, uh, said to me, you know, I'm not really sure what BRI is. I hadn't even asked her, right? She, she said, <laughs> she's, what is BRI? I'm like, wait a second, you're Chinese. Tell me, what is BRI? The reason for this confusion is that BRI, as I said, has just become a slogan. It's like throw BRI onto everything, slap the name BRI, it's, it's all good, right? And so China, China, Africa, in a sense, has also been subsumed into BRI. So here we are in Kenya. Every project in Kenya is, oh, of course, it's BRI. We're like on the Indian Ocean, and the Indian Ocean is part of the Silk Road. I mean, there's a whole deep mythology about the Silk Road and what all, all this means, but I don't want to spoil the party, right? It's all fun, it's all great, right? There's this history, yes, it's, let's call it the Silk Road. Kenya has a claim to it, yes, there was this connection, you know, during the Ming Dynasty to Kenya, et cetera, et cetera, Zhenghe, and, um, I'm correcting your pronunciation, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, but actually there's a very profound connection between China, Africa, and BRI that is, that is generally n not perceived and is therefore widely overlooked. And the profound connection is that what happened between China and Africa beginning in the 1990s <coughs> was really a kind of learning experience that prepped China for the Belt and Road. Why would I say that? So we have already seen that China discovered in, through these conversations that the center, meaning the Communist Party and the central government, forced the provincial governments to kind of engage in, which is like, so we need you to go out, we want you to go out to Africa, make that your priority. And the provincial governments, as I told you, sort of had this moment of puzzlement, like what would we do? We've, we've never been to Africa, we don't have anything to sell. This, are, this comes to the conclusion, oh, that actually we do have a competitive advantage in infrastructure development. Um, this insight is, was kind of the training wheels for BRI. What is BRI ex other than a massive infrastructure development program, right? I do not believe that China started in the 1990s thinking, okay, we'll do this in Africa, and that will become the prelude to doing this 
throughout Central Asia and on to Europe. However, I do believe that the experience that China gleaned in Africa from the 1990s onward has been fundamental in understanding its strategies and approaches toward uh, a, a more general push toward global expansion, toward global engagement, toward global business through infrastructure development. And the advantages that China got <coughs> in Africa that received a kind of proof of concept which encouraged the Chinese state to, to, to pursue them on this much bigger stage, this world stage called the, that has come to be called BRI. So what are these advantages? The advantages are <coughs> that, again, mostly state companies, meaning state infrastructure development companies, will go out into the world and seek contracts, and that Chinese state banks, the jargon for these is policy banks, these Chinese state banks, China Development Bank, etc., cetera, um, will guarantee financing at a mixture of commercial and, <coughs> and subsidized rates, uh, and that um, Chinese workers will carry out um, a very large portion of the actual physical labor in these projects, and that Chinese providers of the, the, the sort of principal materials that go into in infrastructure development will provide those materials. So the, if, you, if you think about these various components, the synergies are incredible. So China lends, and I don't, this is, this is, is just how it is, right? I, this isn't negative, this isn't positive. I think that kind of polarity is, is not, usually not helpful in this kind of discussion. China goes out and it says, we'll lend money. First of all, we'll, so our companies, the, the builders, will go out and they will drum up business and the state banks will provide the financing. So a Kazakhstan or a Tajikistan or a, an Uganda or um, what have you, a Greece or most recently Italy or uh, you know, Costa Rica, it could be Jamaica. Who, um, maybe they have trouble raising the kinds of capital they would need for their infrastructure development on a large scale. We'll provide the guaranteed financing at a mixture of commercial and um, uh, subsidized rates, right? Our companies will provide the materials. We will provide the engineering expertise uh, and the other high-end stuff. And we will provide, in most cases, a very goodly portion of the mid-level and even low-level labor that goes into these projects. So the beauty of this from the Chinese point of view is that all of this flows back to China. So China lends, let's imagine, a billion dollars to country X to build a bridge or a road or an airport or what have you, right? That money has to be, that's, that's financing. That money has to be paid back and a portion of that is a, at a commercial rate, which means China makes a, a profit from the lending from that, simply at a financial level. However, m what's better is that the financing is financing to a Chinese company to build the thing, right? It's not to a Greek company or to a Ugandan company or to a Costa Rican company, generally speaking. It's to a Chinese contractor to build the thing. And when the Chinese contractor needs to, sets out to build the thing, what does it need to do so? It needs steel, it needs cement, it needs aluminum, it needs optic fiber, it needs whatever the other various kinds of components that go into these sorts of big project is. And it sources those things where? In China. And the people who do the physical labor and the people who do the higher end labor are also, to a large extent, sourced in China. And so the billion dollars gets loaned out to, com to country X, Y, or Z. And all of that, or nearly all of that, flows back to China, meaning China is being paid in multiple ways, right? It's being paid at the level of simple finance. You have to service that finance, which means there's a profit at the financial level but that finance is also being used to, to pay Chinese companies who hire Chinese workers and use Chinese materials, meaning all of that revenue is flowing back to China in a way of, of kind of these, creates these 
incredible synergies and virtual, virtuous cycles of finance, right? <clears throat> so China discovered all of that in Africa, in China, Africa, right? And I say this isn't good or this isn't bad, and I'm gonna close on how you should think of good or bad, right? Um, it's just the way it is. It's a model that China discovered, and who's to blame China for setting, uh, setting itself up this way, right? It didn't find it, any competitors in the <coughs> global kind of um, high ambition infrastructure development market. It said we have a great stock of standing expertise and capacity in these sorts of industries, and we have three or four trillion dollars of national savings uh, that we need to find a better way to deploy than simply putting them all in American Treasury bills. Uh, so this is something that makes sense for us, right? Um, and China proved these concepts in Africa, and then in the last, what, since 2013, has morphed them into something called Belt and Road, which it has spread all around the world to this point, where Belt and Road, as my Chinese friend asked me, so what is Belt and Road? Belt and Road, you, almost the only place you can't find Belt and Road is in the United States. I mean, Belt and Road, that's not literally true. So there's no Belt and Road in Japan. There's no Belt and Road, I think, in India. There's no Belt and Road in a few places, but pretty much Belt and Road is everywhere, right? China learned all of those strategies in Africa. China perfected all of those approaches in Africa. China didn't set out, as I said, I've seen no evidence to think that China set out in 1992 and said, phase one is Africa, phase two will do the same thing in you know, something we'll call Belt and Road. However, China mastered the know-how and the financial expertise and the kind of integration of these various syner synergistic elements in Africa. And China learned <coughs> lots of other lessons in Africa. So Africa is 54 countries, meaning Africa is highly balkanized. Africa has high political risk in many of its countries. Uh, Africa is poorly integrated in many ways. Well, so I don't know if many of you have been to Central Asia, but that's a pretty good description of Central Asia. Central Asia is balkanized. Central Asia has lots of political risk. Um, Central Asia has um, uh, economic underdevelopment, it has misgovernance, et cetera, et cetera. So China learned at a political level how to deal in these environments in Africa, and it's applying those lessons on a much bigger scale today around the world. And so Africa has been, in that sense, a great school for China. Uh, Africans tend to think of other people coming, giving lessons, and sort of sp spreading things or sharing things. Africa has been the springboard for other parts of the world. Just before this talk, I gave a, a, a brief kind of introduction to my current book project, was actually, which is actually about how Africa developed Europe, right? Um, Africa has this long history of being a springboard for other parts of the world. It's an unfortunate history in some ways for Africa because it often hasn't worked out to, to Africa's advantage. Uh, uh, it's also unfortunate because Africa often is not recognized in this way, even after having served the benef for the benefit of other parts of the world so generously, right? It's almost never gets mentioned in a way, in a way of recognition, but Africa has been the, sp the springboard of China in terms of this next phase of China's own development. So what is in it for Africa? This, I promise, will be my last little bit, right? A lot of the China-Africa conversation gets wrapped up into pro-China or anti-China discussion. And I'm American, and so for some people that would inevitably mean, oh, he's American, therefore that means he's coming from a point of view that is critical of China, or uh, on the other side of the coin, if a Chinese person is talking to you, you may expect much the same from them from the other direction. I can't blame you if you wish to cling to that point of view. However, I'd like to urge you to think about things in another way. So it's high time, in my view, that Africa find a way to escape being caught up in these kinds of polarities, right? And to begin to think in a more rational and systematic way about Africa's own self-interest. If you ask me, is China good for Africa? My answer to you is that depends. 
China, the fact that China wants to do, has big ambitions in this part of the world is um, everything else being equal, a good thing. Having people that want to do business with you, having people who want to invest, having more partners, potential partners, is a net good, right? I don't think there's any way of escaping that. I don't, you know, any American or any European or any anyone who tells you that China Africa is simply a bad thing is is there's something not right, right? Having partners who want to do ambitious things with you is good. However, it's not enough, right? A partnership means that you have to know what you want, a successful partnership. A successful partnership means that you have to be, remain in control of your end of the equation, of what you're going to get out of this and what you're going to have to pay for this, right? <coughs> and I think that this isn't unique to China, Africa. I think that there's this, if one thinks historically speaking, there's this irrational exuberance that one can see in African history where new partners come along and Africans begin to ex invest kind of an excess optimism about the things that they're gonna get from these partnerships, forgetting sometimes that the people who are engaging with you are, rightly speaking, engaging with you for their own interest. That doesn't mean they're bad guys. That doesn't mean there's something wrong with them. That means they're, they're acting out of the most normal impulses of human nature. People travel far away to engage with another place. It means they've come for something, right? They didn't just leave their home wandering around. They, they, they showed up looking for something, right? It doesn't mean, they may be very friendly, but it doesn't mean they came because they're friendly. They came because they had something they were looking for. This shouldn't be stigmatized. This isn't a criticism of China. The Europeans came here too. They were looking for something. Much of that history is very ugly, right? But Africans have to be, I think, more realistic and more skeptical and more rigorous about figuring out the best ways to operationalize these engagements for their own true long-term national interests. And I've used the word national, and um, that's probably the best place to end because you know, there's this very unfortunate, one of the many unfortunate legacies of the imperial period in Africa is that Africa is very famously this highly balkanized environment. I've already said 54 countries. Most of the countries are small. Many of the countries are landlocked. Um, many of the countries have no natural resources that are highly prized on world markets. S some of them do uh, um, and have high concentrations of these things. In other words, this is a very uneven, an unwieldy kind of space in terms of political economy, right? Um, this is a legacy that's gonna be very hard to overcome under the best of circumstances, but Africa's gotta figure out a way to overcome it, right? And going one by one to negotiate a railroad or um, you know, an industrialization plan or um, uh, things of that scale and nature, right? is probably not gonna be the way to get your best deal, right? Africans have been slow, in my view, somebody who's been watching this for 20 years, in understanding this, right? So the Chinese begin to explore the business, business in the way I described in the early 1990s, and it really ramps up and around 2000, 2001, 2003, sort of achieves a kind of high, uh, kind of um, cruising altitude and has this immense momentum of, of its own, right? And my, the fee, this, and this coincides with the time when I begin to look closely at, at, at what we call China, Africa, right? The, the, the feeling that I most remember from this period is one of this most extraordinary exuberance, right? The African countries, I'm not talking about the populations for the most part. It's hard to know what populations think in general, but it was very easy to know what the people in government felt, what the elites felt. The Chinese are coming, they want to do this, they want to do that, they have money, they're guaranteed, you know, they said, no problem, like, you can't bring the, fi we'll bring the financing, right? There was this extraordinary exuberance, and I don't blame, I mean, it's understandable at the human level, but it was not ideal in terms of protecting one's own self-interest. To be really crude and quick about this, the idea was, so, 
they came and they were they were so they they were so eager to do business. I just said, you know, where do we sign, right? And nobody paid much attention to the details. N not even at the national level. Never mind thinking that maybe the best way to do this isn't at the national level. Maybe the best way, if I am a Ghana, a Togo, and a Burkina Faso, is to build an integrated plan. Or if I'm a Kenya, a Tanzania, and a Uganda, to build an integrated plan. Or if I'm a Sudan, or a South Sudan, and an Ethiopia, to build an integrated plan. Or if I'm a Zambia, and a Zimbabwe, and a Botswana, to build an integrated plan. Now you may object that the Chinese didn't that's not what they came to offer, and they were really in a hurry to do business, and they're being very generous, and they wanted us to sign something, but that's to lose sight of your own control and agency in these matters, right? And it's the duty of, it's not the duty of the Chinese to tell you what's best for you. And in fact, the Chinese have been very good about that. They say, it's not our business to tell you. We just want to know, what do you want to do? Tell us what you want to do. But the Africans so far have not been very good, in my view, even as of this late date, in asserting a clear vision of what's best for them in these bargains. They're lucky to have partners that are growing in number. It's not just the Chinese. The Turks, the Russians, India is, of course, very important. There are many, uh, there's a proliferation of partners, right? But the Africans have to elevate their game in order to be able to extract something that shows a vision and that shows an understanding of leverage and that shows a, a, a kind of w a willingness to kind of think beyond, outside of the box in the cliche, beyond the sort of balkanized realities that are kind of permitting permanent limitation for African development. Otherwise, there will be no end to African underdevelopment. So I'll stop there, I've talked too much. Um, I look forward to your questions and uh, thank you very much.